inviting me here tonight to speak to you. I'm going to hang my cane right there. It always reminds me when it's time to leave. I have served as a Yankee sailor, or tar as some of you may know it, in our Navy from our war with France in 1798 through the most recent conflict with Great Britain. My career has not been remarkable for its glory or riches or fame, but rather, I hope, its honor, service, and duty. I was present during many of the Navy's greatest campaigns, from the Mediterranean Sea to the Chesapeake Bay. I also served aboard some of our most famous frigates, from the Constitution to the Constellation. Like many of my shipmates, referred to as Preble's boys, I studied under the famed disciplinarian, Captain Edward Preble. I also rose from the rank of midshipman to captain, using my skills for navigation, organization, and leadership. So I will tell you my story since I've been asked to do so. I was born on September 16, 1773, one of nine children of Benjamin and my dear mother, Azuba Tarbell, in Groton, of Middlesex County, about 50 miles northwest of Boston. It's a small country town, and I pursued a career in the Navy because there was generally a lack of opportunities there, and I longed to be at sea. Now, at the time, you may ask why, because a seaman made only $17 a month, whereas a laborer on land could make double that. However, Many seamen were wooed by the siren of prize money, in addition to adventure and glory. Furthermore, if one could become an officer, then life aboard ship improved significantly. After serving as a mariner for several years in the Merchant Marine, I observed the ship Constitution being built in Hart's shipyard in Boston. Once Constitution was ready for sea, a notice appeared in the local paper, which I have preserved. It reads, Orders having been received for the nomination of warrant and petty officers for the United States Frigate Constitution, now lying in Boston Harbor, notice is hereby given that applications for the following stations will be received by the subscriber if made immediately. Eight midshipmen, one boatswain, one gunner, one ship carpenter, one sailmaker, and two master's mates. No application will be considered as good unless accompanied with recommendations on the seamanship, capability, integrity, and sobriety of the applicant. Samuel Nicholson. May 2nd, 1798. I then entered service aboard Constitution as an able seaman, a rated man, not an officer. President John Adams soon ordered all ships to sea to patrol for French ships and to free any Americans captured by them. Now, Constitution was still not ready to sail and had to borrow 16 cannons from the fort at nearby Castle Island out in the harbor. She put to sea in July with orders to patrol the Atlantic seaboard. She was patrolling between the Chesapeake Bay and Georgia when Captain Nicholson found our first opportunity for a prize. The Constitution intercepted the ship Niger off the coast of South Carolina in September. She was small, a 24-gun ship with a French crew en route to Philadelphia, although they claimed to have been under the British flag. Nicholson had the crewmen in prison and placed a prize crew aboard her, and we brought her into Norfolk. This was my
my first visit to Virginia's busiest port. Constitution sailed south again to escort a merchant convoy, but her bowsprit broke in a gale, and she returned to Boston. In the meantime, Secretary of the Navy, Benjamin Stoddard, determined that the Niger had indeed been under a British flag, and she was returned and her crew released, and no prize money was awarded. Now, I can't speak for the sobriety of the crew on that particular venture, especially given that our bowsprit broke, but I will note something of interest. On that first voyage, we carried exactly 2,143 gallons of rum. <laughs> In December 1798, I was finally appointed a midshipman due to the fact that another midshipman was dismissed only a few days earlier due to his poor behavior. Now they're called midshipmen because they live in the middle part of the ship, or amidships. Captains often sought out new midshipmen in the foremost jacks, the common crew, the seamen, inquiring with officers as to their capabilities and their skills. If a crewman's name was mentioned by an officer, then the captain might take that application seriously. Either way, the frigate departed Boston in December, and Nicholson reported to Commodore John Barry in the frigate United States in the West Indies Station. In January 1799, we intercepted an English ship, which had been taken prize by a French crew not too long before that. Technically, it was a French ship operated by a French crew, but Nicholson released her the next morning, hesitant after our affair with the Niger. Upon joining Commodore Barry's command, Constitution then had to put in for repairs. This after a storm damaged some of her rigging. Again, I don't vouch for the sobriety of the crew. In early March, we encountered the British vessel Santa Margarita, whose captain was a friend of Nicholson's. The two agreed to a sailing duel. But after 11 hours of straight sailing, the Santa Margarita admitted defeat and paid off the bet with, you guessed it, a cask of wine. Resuming our patrols, Constitution recaptured an American sloop and also captured a French merchantman. We finally returned to Boston in May, where Captain Nicholson was dismissed, and we were paid off. Captain Silas Talbot was then appointed, a Massachusetts man like myself, to command Constitution and serve as Commodore in the West Indies Station. We departed Boston again to interrupt French shipping. However, en route, the Constitution put into Lynn Haven Rose in Norfolk my second visit to this area. We then took a prize from a French crew in September and sent the ship back to New York with an American crew. We arrived in the West Indies in October and rendezvoused with the Boston, the General Green, and the Norfolk. Nothing occurred over the next six months as French depredations in the area had declined precipitously. We busied ourselves with patrols, and Captain Talbot made diplomatic visits, sometimes taking his lieutenants and even a midshipman or two. In April 1800, Talbot discovered that the French privateer, known as the Sandwich, a very menacing name, had taken refuge in San Domingo. Not too long after that, we captured another sloop, and Captain Talbot passed the plan to use that sloop to capture the sandwich by gaining access to the harbor. He put a shipmate of mine, Lieutenant Isaac Hull, in charge of this expedition, and he took 90 men, including myself, into the harbor where we captured the sandwich and spiked the guns of the fort. However, sadly, the fort and everything around there was neutral territory. So she was eventually returned to the French with our apologies, and no prize money was paid out. However, I briefly served as prize master of 
that ship from showing gallantry during the fight. In August 1800, Constitution returned to Boston, where Captain Talbot finally promoted me to lieutenant. So I earned my first epithet on the left, what the British call a left tent, for obvious reasons, because it's on the left. <laughs> The next evening, some of the crew got drunk and laid violent hands on the officer. So Captain Talbot summoned us and we grabbed pistols and cutlasses to subdue them. As punishment, we put 150 men of the crew on an island in the harbor for two days and ordered them to do their laundry. Not too long after that, us being in peacetime now, Nearly 100 officers were released from the Navy, including 36 lieutenants. Myself and several of my shipmates, however, were retained. In April 1801, I was ordered to the Essex, a frigate. Captain William Bainbridge commanded her, and she sailed to the Mediterranean with the squadron of Commodore Richard Dale, a man whom I'm sure many of you know since he was born in nearby Portsmouth. Dispatched to protect American trade and seamen against depredations by the Barbary pirates, we arrived at Gibraltar and spent the year convoying merchantmen and blockading Tripolitan ships. I was given the honor of commanding the quarter deck guns aboard the Essex. For those of you who don't know, the quarter deck is at the stern of the ship, generally where the captain makes his rounds. Along with Lieutenant Stephen Decatur, another shipmate of mine, we were assigned to lead boarders against enemy, any enemy vessels that we encountered. The Essex eventually returned home for repairs at the Washington Navy Yard in 1802, and I was sent on, put on furlough until August to visit my family. In May 1803, I repaired once again to Boston, where the Constitution had been laid up in ordinary. Captain Edward Preble, also a Massachusetts man, but at the time it was considered a northern territory beyond the state, Captain Preble selected me from a list of lieutenants to serve with him. From June to August, he sent me on a recruiting trip around New England. Eventually, Preble sailed to the Mediterranean with myself as first lieutenant. In October 1803, an American frigate, the Philadelphia, ran aground in Tripoli Harbor and was captured along with all of her officers and crew. That month, Preble ordered me to take command of a captured Tripolitan vessel and proceed with him to Tangier Bay to search out additional enemy vessels. <coughs> However, several of my men decided to desert when they were sent ashore for provisions in the ship's boat. Upon learning that they were on board the HMS Medusa, a Royal Navy frigate, I implored the British kindly to return those men. They kindly refused. <laughs> now, although they would not return them to me, I was able to capture a few and return them to duty, at least in shackles. Captain Preble, however, had determined to rescue the frigate Philadelphia and the crew from the Tripolitan. The U.S. had captured another Tripolitan vessel and renamed her the Intrepid. They re-rigged her with short masts and triangular sails to look like a local vessel. In February 1804, in the guise of a distressed vessel, the Intrepid sailed towards Philadelphia. Lieutenant Decatur and his crew quickly boarded and burned the ship where she lay. The success of this dramatic event led to his promotion from lieutenant directly to captain, an amazing feat. I, of course, was very proud of him, although I did not journey on that particular expedition. That summer, however, I learned firsthand just how demanding an officer's life could be. 
in June 1804, near Malta, I nearly ran the Constitution aground. Yes, I admit it, I nearly beached our ship of state. As first officer, I had the noon watch, and at 1.45 p.m., a midshipman, whom I still have to track down, interrupted Captain Preble's lunch to tell him that the frigate appeared dangerously close to shore. He viewed the shore through his cabin ports, sprang up on deck, where he quickly relieved me from duty, and then loudly accused me of neglect in front of all the crew. However, Captain Preble also believed that the pilot who was advising me was guilty of trying to beach the ship, and he ordered the pilot confined in irons. Preble remained on deck through the afternoon and evening, supervising our arrival in Malta, while I sadly remained below. <coughs> he wrote to me that day saying, and I've retained the letter, Sir, the imminent danger which you a few moments since ran this ship into either through neglect or want of judgment, obliges me to withdraw confidence in you, so far as to consider it imprudent that you should in future be entrusted with the charge of watch on board her, as her loss would be an involved and incalculable loss to the U.S. You will therefore consider yourself as a supernumerary until ordered to some other vessel of less consequence. For those of you who don't know, a supernumerary is anyone who is not part of the crew, such as a civilian or a diplomat. That is a very grave insult to a seaman, though. Four days later, the officers of the Constitution wrote to Captain Preble on my behalf. June 9, 1804. Sir, we venture to address you in behalf of our messmate, Lieutenant Harvey. A retrospect of his deportment here to Pure, as a gentleman and correct officer, prior to the unfortunate evening of the 5th, induces us powerfully to exert ourselves that if consistent, he may be again ordered to duty with us as usual. Mr. Tarbell is conscious of his error and says, "'Twas founded on his too great a confidence in the pilot. We believe this to be the case sincerely. We have always considered Mr. Tarbell to be one of our most correct officers, and the circumstances above alluded to, which has incurred your displeasure, will, he says, be a lesson which he can never lose sight of and it was signed by all of my messmates. Later that day, Preble kindly dropped the neglect of duty charges against me and wrote me a letter, part of which I read to you. From this circumstance and a solicitation on the part of your brother officers, highly honorable to you, that you may still continue among them, I am induced to direct you to return to your duty in full confidence that you will in the future be more guarded in your conduct. That was what we would call a mild reprimand from <laughs> Captain Freeman. <coughs> After receiving this letter, I was much relieved, and on June 10th, I again took the watch on the quarter deck. Subsequently, we carried out multiple bombardments of Tripoli in the summer of 1804. By spring, the conflict ended, and the peace treaty with Tripoli was signed in the Constitution's cabin. I then returned home aboard the frigate President. But as one of the officers with Commodore Preble, I was included in a resolution of Congress for gallantry and good conduct, and was even given a sword along with all the other officers. In 1806, the Navy made me the master of the Washington Navy Yard under Commandant Thomas Tingey. While there, I berthed in the frigate Congress, 
which was in the eastern branch of the Potomac River at the time. This was a policy written by Master Commandant John Cassidy, which read, Officers on shore needed to live on the ship in ordinary and to ensure their vessels and crews were inspected at least once a day and their ships be kept clean and sweet. And of course, ready for sea. <coughs> Cassin proposed that all these activities be placed under the supervision of a master of the yard. <coughs> the Washington Navy Yard became the Navy's largest facility and was considered a prestigious assignment. From March to June, I settled into my new duty station and even helped refit the frigate Chesapeake, which was making ready for her ill-fated voyage, which I will tell you about later. At that time, I also joined the Sonic Lodge, Naval Lodge Number 4, which was chartered in May 1805. The lodge met in a small two-story brick dwelling in Washington. In summer of 1806, I was again furloughed, this time for my health. During that time, I met and married Elizabeth Ann Camden at St. Patrick's Church in Washington in October 1806. Eliza was, as you can guess, the daughter of Master Commandant John Cassin, so you can guess how we met. The Cassins were a Catholic family, and so I converted to the faith. We have two daughters, one of whom was born in Washington in 1809. And myself and my family lived at the Washington Navy Yard until I was transferred to another duty station. Eliza's brother, Stephen Casson, also was an officer in the Navy who served with me in the Barbary Wars. He, too, was a major. In spring 1807, the Navy sent several midshipmen to the Navy Yard. Reverend Robert Thompson, a chaplain in the Navy, was ordered on the special duty of instructing those young gentlemen in mathematics and navigation. And together, we berthed in the same ship and taught the midshipmen aboard the Congress. The practice of training midshipmen aboard ships and ports continues to this day based on that tradition, although we do not yet have a Navy, Naval Academy of our own. In July 1807, the Navy ordered me to Gosport Naval Yard, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with here in Norfolk County, where I renewed my friendship with my old shipmate, Captain Stephen Decatur. We were both veterans of the Barbary War, and we were both familiar with shipbuilding. Norfolk was one of many sites that was selected to construct a gunboat flotilla, and Decatur oversaw the program at Gosport. Known as Jefferson's Bulldogs, the gunboats were the president's answer to those who wished to reestablish a peacetime navy. Jefferson thought frigates were costly and outnumbered and overmatched by the Royal Navy, and of course he was right. But he also preferred to defend America's coast in the harbors, bays, and rivers, as opposed to the deep blue sea. To do this, he argued, we needed small, maneuverable vessels that could be sailed in a wind or rowed in a calm. Jefferson's administration did this on the advice of many naval officers, which of course led to a difference of opinion about this entire bureaucratic process. In the end, Congress authorized the construction of 188 gunboats. Several were built in Hampton, just across the river, on the designs of Captain James Barron, whom I'm sure you are also familiar with, maybe even kin to, since he is a native of Hampton. His first design showed a single-masted vessel of 64 feet. It also showed a bowsprit, one bow gun, and space for 12 oarsmen to row. Another of his designs resembled our local oyster boats. However, due to the cost of building these gunboats, President Madison ended the program in 1809. 
Either way, in the summer of 1807, I began recruiting sailors everywhere I could in order to gain the full complement of at least 30 men per boat. Recruitment was slow, and I traveled even up to Baltimore to meet my quota. Sailors knew they had little chance of prize money in harbor, and the constant draw of grog shops and freedom induced many of them to leave, even after they had signed on. Captain Decatur himself was never a true advocate of the gunboat program. And when one of our gunboats sank in six fathoms, or 36 feet, he sarcastically remarked that it would be a shame if the entire flotilla sank in 100 fathoms, which would be many, many, many feet, multiplied by six. In June 1807, Decatur was appointed to command the frigate Chesapeake, which I mentioned earlier, leaving me in command of our undermanned gunboat flotilla. The reason for his new command, however, was a matter of national honor. And I will tell you that story now. In January 1807, Master Commandant Charles Gordon was appointed the Chesapeake's commanding officer. He was ordered to prepare for duty to the Mediterranean. James Barron was, of course, appointed squadron commander. Now, unfortunately, the Chesapeake was in much disarray from years of sitting in ordinary and needed months of repairs. At the same time, in spring 1807, several British vessels were on the coast blockading two French ships in the bay. A number of British seamen then deserted from their ship, and Norfolk authorities gave them sanctuary. One of the deserters, or at least one, joined the crew of the Chesapeake and made himself known to British officers by shouting obscenities at them in the street. Not a wise decision on his part. Other deserters were reported to be at the Gosport Navy Yard under the command of Captain Decatur. Decatur received a letter from the British consul imploring him to return the men <coughs> to him. The consul claimed that they had illegally enlisted in the U.S. Navy, but Captain Decatur denied any knowledge of this. On June 22, 1807, the Chesapeake passed the case and the British warship HMS Leopard quickly pursued. Soon the Leopard attacked and boarded the frigate looking for deserters. Chesapeake was unprepared and after a few broadsides which killed several men, Barron surrendered the frigate. She had only fired one shot. Four crew members were removed by the British and tried for desertion. One was even hanged. Chesapeake then returned to Gosport for repairs after suffering such a devastating blow. The public was, of course, outraged and shocked by what had occurred, as I'm sure you all were at that time. There were calls for war with Great Britain. However, these quickly subsided. President Jefferson threatened the British government in order to settle the matter, but his failure to negotiate and coerce Britain led him toward an economic strategy known as the embargo. In February 1808, I was one of four lieutenants who served on the court-martial that tried Captain Barron after the, the, after the Chesapeake Leopard affair. The trial for Captain Barron and Commander Gordon, my old shipmate, was held aboard the Chesapeake in the Elizabeth River. This was one of the most extraordinary court-martials in the history of our Navy. It also exemplified the infighting that I've seen in this service as Barron and Decatur had an intense dislike for each other, which continues to this day. Fortunately, neither one of them have ever demanded satisfaction, and they have not come to blows on the matter. And I hope it remains that way. This trial also cemented my own personal ties to Hampton Roads as the area rallied around Captain Barron. Here I came in contact with Barron's defense lawyer, Robert Taylor, who later was the general of militia during the war at Fort Norfolk. I also was introduced to his prosecutor, Littleton Tadwell, who 
represented many honest sailors seeking their prize money during the war. In fact, many have credited him for using his negotiation skills to avert war with the British. In the end, sadly, we found Barron guilty and we suspended him from the service for five years. Gordon, however, received only a mild reprimand, although he would not be promoted for several years. Later that year, I was finally commissioned Master Commandant, what the British call Master in Commander. So I was thus enabled to move my epaulette from the left to the right side to symbolize my rise in rank, which meant now that instead of walking through a door with my left shoulder, I had to walk through a door with my right, thus showing my rank immediately. Either way, that year the Navy sent me to Wilmington, North Carolina to oversee the construction of the schooner Alligator, also known as Gunboat Number 166. This gunboat carried four guns and 40 men. In 1810, I took command of the Siren of 18 guns in New Orleans. There I combated pirates, smugglers, and slave traders. Although I do have a letter which my wife preserved from that time period, which I will read to you. January 13, 1809. My dear wife, this moment an opportunity offered by way of Baltimore to inform you I am still here and enjoy good health with the blessings of God. The schooner is completely repaired, and when we shall say God only knows, I am in hopes by the 20th of the month. Captain Porter is put to it for men. The English are giving $40 a month, and the Spanish the same. My dear, time hangs heavy on my mind, being so long absent from you and our beloved daughter. I barely could sleep for thoughts of home. On that I had taken passage on our first arriving in this place, if I thought of being here so long, nothing would have prevented me from being with you now. I must repeat my own maxim. Keep up your spirits. I will be with you soon, wind and weather permitting. My dear, please present my love to the family and accept my sincere affection for my wife and daughter. Mr. Tarbell. In October 1811, after rebuilding the ship Hornet of 18 guns at the Washington Navy Yard, I was ordered to take command of the John Adams at Boston. <coughs> The John Adams was a 28-gun frigate. I reached Boston eager to take on this new project, which was now under my first commander, Captain Samuel Nicholson, who was now the commander of the yard. However, I found that no work had taken place, and the ship's guns were still aboard. By mid-December, carpenters were employed and making good progress. But making the challenge more difficult, Captain Nicholson died that month, thereby making me temporary commander of the yard in addition to my normal everyday duties. In the spring of 1812, I was temporarily removed from command of the John Adams due to suspicion that I had mismanaged funds for the project and made poor decisions on refitting the vessel. However, I was reinstated after being exonerated by a court of inquiry. I continued to command the John Adams until March 1813. When war broke out in June, the frigate was taken to New York, where I helped oversee repairs there. Now this inquiry I mentioned did leave a black mark on my otherwise unblemished record, except for almost beating the Constitution. Indeed, several officers were quickly promoted <laughs> over my head. The Navy's censure of my work on the John Adams bruised my pride, but not my resolve. At the outset of the war with Great Britain, the late war, I found myself in a quandary. My career was languishing, and I had a growing family to provide for. I had to survive on $60 a month and five rations a day and my second daughter, Henrietta, was born that year. The British blockade and the short
shortage of sailors prevented the John Adams from going to sea from New York. So like any good naval officer, I quickly requested another command. In spring 1813, I arrived in Washington, our capital, and immediately began on securing a new duty station. In March, I wrote a letter to President Madison questioning the validity of the promotions of other officers because I learned this was due to my actions with the John Adams. I will read you my, part of my letter here. March 27, 1813. Sir, I feel that an apology is necessary for thus intruding on your time in addressing you on a subject which is painful to me in the utmost. I, however, hope and beg your indulgence. It appears in the statement of promotions made at the last session of Congress that junior officers in the Navy of the U States have been promoted over me. And since my arrival, I am informed that John Adams was the cause. I am not aware of any error on my part in repairs to that ship, it having been recommended by Captain Cassin. And I was ordered previous to my taking command of her that she might be enabled to carry more guns. True, I did superintend the repairs agreeable to the order of the Secretary of the Navy, which I take the liberty of enclosing. Being somewhat acquainted with shipbuilding, I followed my instructions, as I think, in an officer-like manner. And to suffer for what I am not guilty of is painful beyond conception. I have been in the service of my country 15 years, and when our little Navy has been in motion, I have been actively employed, making the Naval Service my study, and have the satisfaction of saying that I have brought myself forward to the rank I now have the honor of holding by my own merit. And never to my knowledge have I committed an act which would cause a blush as an officer. I look up to you, sir, for redress. And I feel persuaded that you will take my case into consideration and do me that justice which the nature of the case will allow and which an officer in the service of his country is entitled to. Very respectfully, et cetera, et cetera, Joseph Tarbell. Well, fortunately, my letter had the desired effect since I was shortly thereafter assigned to duty in Norfolk. President Madison realized that I would be a valuable asset in Hampton Roads, having been stationed there previously, and due to my experience with the gunboat flotilla. Knowing Secretary Jones would not assign me command of an active vessel, I gladly accepted shore duty in hopes of finally obtaining additional glory and honor, the sole goal of any naval officer. In addition, my father-in-law, Captain Casson, had taken command of the Gosport Naval Yard in August 1812 and would provide oversight. However, I will read you a letter about his very tempestuous arrival. <laughs> July 1812, this is from my father-in-law. I have the honor to inform you of my arrival at this place on Sunday last, after a very disagreeable passage of 10 days heavy gale and rainy weather, he's always complaining. And I am extremely unwell, but by assistance of Dr. Schofield, I am much better. I caught a violent cold in the river, followed up by going into the house, which is too small entirely for my family. And on the first night, we had 18 inches of water in the cellar. When I was compelled to partake of your liberal instructions, as it respects my quarters, I added two small wings and a kitchen to the house. My office, however, is too small and underneath the hospital. So whenever they wash the floors, water runs all over me and my books. I find we are in want of everything to make it like a Navy yard. Your humble servant, John Cassidy. I am impressed that my father-in-law had such gumption. So I arrived in Norfolk either way in the spring of 1813 to find the constellation blockaded in the Elizabeth River and Virginia militia forces preparing for a British assault. I began recruiting for the gunboat flotilla and wrote to Secretary Jones saying I 
had 17 gunboats ready. The nearby British fleet planned to capture the Constellation, since it was one of America's most well-known frigates. I could not allow this and made the gunboats a priority in the river. The British also determined to capture coastal vessels going up and down the bay, but unfortunately, our flotilla was too small to meet them face to face or hand to hand. The Constellation was the only vessel in Hampton Roads that could challenge British authority. However, with no way to escape the sea, she had little expectation of any action. It came as no surprise when her current commander, or previous commander at the time, Captain Charles Stewart, departed in May to take command of the Constitution in Boston. As I said, an active officer always moves for an active command. Secretary of the Navy Jones instructed Stewart to leave me in command of the frigate. So now I was authorized to command both the gunboat flotilla and the Constellation. Since I was in command of a ship, I was now referred to as captain, although I did not yet have both epaulets you see here. In short order, I had gained a large command in one of the most important strategic ports on the Atlantic coast. However, this promotion was based on the fact that Captain Casson in the yard would remain in overall command. Stuart and Jones both hoped this would ensure success on our part although we all assumed a captain would arrive soon to take command of the vessel. Stewart even gave me some of his correspondence as reference, a piece of which I will read. Norfolk Harbor, April 4th, 1813. Sir, the enemy squadron put to sea on the evening of the 2nd, leaving the victorious of 74 guns off Willoughby Point, one frigate on the tail of the horseshoe, and one in Lynn Haven Bay. I presume the rest have gone to Bermuda to replenish their water and provisions. It appears to me that no time ought to be lost now to erect a battery on Craney Island and to put the flotilla in a respectable condition, for I'm persuaded they intend something more than a blockade of this quarter. Something might be effected against the enemy with fire vessels and powder kegs in the river. But unless I am particularly instructed on this, I do not feel myself authorized to attempt it. I have the honor to be, etc., etc., Charles Stewart. In the days before the British assault on Craney Island, which Captain Stewart referenced, American observers tried to decipher the comings and goings of the British fleet in Hampton Roads. At 3 p.m. Friday afternoon on June 18th, Three frigates came into the roads as high as the Elizabeth River. Spying two sloops and a schooner coming down the James River, their barges moved to intercept them. But our gunboats thankfully came up and drove them back to their original position. By Saturday evening, three frigates were stationed near Old Point Comfort and two ships of the line off Willoughby Spit. Two frigates remained patrolling down by the Capes. That left only the Junon of 38 guns off Newport News, which was now my lone focus. On June 19, Captain Cassin instructed me to advance on that British frigate in the James River. 15 gunboats with about 380 men set out in the early evening hours under cover of dark. They were led by my lieutenants, John Gardner and Robert Henley, and we also took with us about 50 musket men or militiamen. The larger gunboats mounted one long 32-pounder, and some of the other vessels had an 18-pounder. Contrary winds in the river prevented the gunboats from engaging with the enemy until Sunday. By that time, the weather changed, and Junon was becalmed. So we quickly attacked at 4 a.m., our guns blazing away and hulling the British many times. Our 15 guns eventually opposed over 150 guns of the enemy due to the fact that several of their other frigates came up to assist. This is all testified to by Captain Samuel Travis, no sleep, 
Captain Samuel Travis, who was a revenue cutter captain who had been captured by the British and was on board the Junon at that time. The British reported several men killed and wounded, <coughs> and we only had one man killed, shot by a ball. I believe our attack then excited the anger and fury of the Royal Navy and encouraged them to seek vengeance. On June 21st, my gunboats lay stretched across the river. When enemy vessels approached, alarm guns sounded and we were alerted. The British were sounding the waters near Crane Island. It was plain the key to Norfolk was in their view. And once in possession of Craney Island, they could move up the river and threaten Fort Nelson, Fort Norfolk, and the Naval Yard, in addition to the Constellation. So after a second council of war between General Taylor, Captain Casson, myself, and several other officers, we determined to make a stalwart defense of the island. On the morning of June 22nd, we sent 150 sailors and guns to help defend the island a bunch of hardy jack cars. However, I remained with my beloved gunboats. The British barges attempted to land on the island, but stuck fast on the shoals out of range until we pulled our artillery up close. The gunboats guarding the bridge nearby did send several shot and shell toward the Wise Plantation when the British began launching their rockets. At the end of the day, British casualties totaled totaled over 60 men dead and deserted, and an additional 50 men missing. Captain Cassin wrote immediately to Secretary of the Navy to report the victory. I'll read you part of it. June 23rd, sir, I have the honor to inform you on the 20th the enemy got underway in all 13 sail. Finding Craney Island rather weak man, Captain Tarbell directed Lieutenants Neal and Schubert and Sanders with 100 seamen on shore to a small battery on the island. On Tuesday the 22nd, the enemy were landing around the Nansman River, said to be 4,000 troops. At 8 a.m., the barge attempted to land in front of the island to reach shot, but were out of shot of the gunboats. When Lieutenants Neal and his comrades and the Marines and 150 in number of our sailors opened their fire, which was so well directed that the enemy were glad to get off after sinking three of their largest boats one of which was Admiral Warren's boat himself, 50 feet in length, carrying 75 men, known as the Centipede. <laughs> Here he talks about taking on some prisoners, and then says, ah, yes, we commenced throwing rockets from Mr., when the British commenced throwing rockets from Mr. Wise's house, gunboat 67 threw a few shots over the way, that way, and they dispersed. That's my favorite part. In the evening, their boats came round the point of Nansman, and at sunset were seen fleeing to their ships. And at dusk, they strew the shore with fires to run away before the light. This moment, Captain Tarbell has just come up and informs me the enemy have withdrawn their troops from Craney Island and have landed at Newport News. Now, accolades passed freely in the wake of Craney Island, despite the defeat at Hampton. I had accomplished my goals of manning the gunboats, defending the river, and protecting Constellation. Yet despite having me in command of the Constellation, the Navy appointed a new captain, an old shipmate of mine, Charles Gordon. Secretary Jones wanted Gordon to take command of the Constellation at once, but he was held back in Baltimore dealing with the gunboat flotilla there. When he arrived, he quickly began finding things not to his liking. And in typical fashion, he looked for a way to blame myself and Captain Casson of anything that seemed asunder, including several pounds of gunpowder that was ruined by bilge water and various items that were broken or missing. However, during that time, I lived at the shipyard with my family and spent little time aboard the Constellation. In the end, the condition of the Constellation evaded our view given our constant duties, which mostly focused on fitting out the gunboats. In December 1813, I took seven gunboats and two schooners on an expedition up the Chesapeake Bay towards the York River to seek battle with the British. The expedition, however, was aborted when they discovered that we were coming and came out to meet us, using either spies or lights to see us. The expedition, of course, outraged Captain Gordon, who wrote a scathing letter to myself and Secretary of the Navy Jones. 
despite the fact that he was only in command of the constellation itself, not the gunboat flotilla, which was solely under my command. In fact, Jones wrote him saying, the distinct command of the flotilla is vested in Captain Tarbell, for which he is directly responsible to, subject to, direct orders of this department. Now, I have that letter for my own record. As of March 1814, I was in command of 23 gunboats, one barge, and one bomb ship in Norfolk. I put Mass Sailing Master Lewis Page in temporary command while I held supreme command at my headquarters in the Navy Yard. In April, Secretary Jones put Captain Gordon in command of all naval forces there, with myself as his subordinate. And our feud simmered and on and off throughout the year. By autumn 1814, I was again on furlough due to illness. In fact, Captain Gordon wrote to the Secretary of the Navy about our situation. In his letter, he described the earthworks which he had built at the Navy Yard. Of course, I had also participated in that venture since we could not take our vessels to sea. But in one of them, he mentions that my services were at present unimportant on this station, which I would, of course, protest. And he, he offered to Secretary Jones that I might be sent on a recruiting mission. So as you can see, we were not on good terms when the war ended. Regardless, the fleet I helped build kept a constant vigil in the road, but it never again engaged the British fleet. The flotilla had been tested, and although it functioned well, the gunboat navy as a whole did not. However, our daring attack on the Junon in June 1813 was the first attack by gunboats during that war, and it was successful. In February 1815, Captain Gordon tried one last gamble. He tried to set up a ship-to-ship -ship duel with the British. Now, unfortunately for him, and the sailors who would, would have followed him. The war ended, and a storm blew him and the British off course before that duel could take place. With the end of the war upon us, celebrations <coughs> ensued, although I was still convalescent. In March, we delivered the gunboats up to the Navy Yard and the Constellu Constellation weighed anchor and left for New York City. I have remained in Norfolk, although I am once again restored, when, when I am restored to health, I plan to travel to Washington to seek an active command. I thank you for visiting with me tonight in this fair city of ours that I have come to call home over the last several years. And I will be downhearted truly when our fates no longer intertwine. I wish you all fair winds and calm seas. Thank you and God bless you. In 1918, 
a U.S. Navy destroyer or modern-day gunboat, was sponsored by a family member and christened the USS Harvest. So they believe this, this tavern sign is from that time period. 